Well, I've got some fantastic work and some really interesting things to show to you guys in this episode. But before we jump into it, uh, I want to talk about a comment uh, left a couple of video videos ago that said, nah, I, don't, or I no longer want a GMC motorhome. And I think he just got discouraged seeing all of the, uh, the work, all the details that I'm having to address in the rebuild of this motorhome. Now, first of all, you don't have to have a project quite as deep as the one that I'm doing. You can find these motorhomes which were already rebuilt by somebody who was very talented maybe in the 1990s. I think there's a lot of them that were rebuilt in the 90s that are for sale now. You know, guys who are, I don't know, maybe they're turning 80 years old or something and they just, they're, they're never going to travel again and so they're they're willing to sell these things. And uh, fortunately for, for you guys out there, um, no matter how nice they are, there seems to be sort of an upper ceiling. Unless it's like this collectible original, like one of the, like the Coca-Cola one or something like that. Um, but, but if they've been sort of restored, they're all sort of, I don't know, $50,000, nothing more than that, which is, uh, you know, worth it if somebody's already done all this work. And if somebody hasn't done the work, it's a tremendous opportunity because, as I said in the very first episode that kicked this series off, where I was talking about the A-team of just fantastic designers, from the Boeing aircraft engineer to the Corvette, you know, uh, what is it, the composite, the SMC composites to the to the um, the Cadillac luxury guy, you know. So they just had just the best team of designers making these things. And Detroit never, ever tried to do anything this special again. They didn't do it before and they didn't do it after. This is a one-of-a-kind. These transmodes are really amazing. So the uh, the workers on the factory floor, though, they didn't, they didn't, <laughs> they were not at that same level, which means you have the opportunity to make these things better than they ever were coming off the factory floor. And you can work on top of the fantastic design work that those guys put into it. I think, geez, the first versions of these came out in 73, so they were probably working on these in 1960 is when, is when they were designing these. So yeah, that's that's old, you guys. That's 51 years old now since since somebody uh, put their heart and their soul into this design. Yeah, tremendous opportunity. Please adopt a GMC motorhome. Don't get discouraged. There's not a single day that I've ever regretted buying this. As much work as it is, sitting here in my driveway, my wife doesn't like it because it's still an eyesore. It's true. But she gets excited every time I make a little bit of progress. I get excited. It's just a long-term uh, project for me, and I think it's a fantastic hobby. Better than playing cards or something else, so... Yeah, with that, let's just uh, jump into the work and see what I did. So taking a look at the current battery tray that's in the uh, in the motorhome, it's not looking so good. And yeah, this is just tetanus waiting to happen. <laughs> it's ridiculous. There's a piece of it right there. Not to mention the fact that there's no strap holding this battery in. So all the driving that I've been doing uh, with this motorhome is with the battery just sort of hanging out right there. And just the weight of the battery and the sort of lips on the tray are what kept it from falling out. Now this is the tray that I pulled out of that donor motorhome a couple years ago, and I've been using this brush, this wire brush, to kind of clean the bulk of the rust off. And then you can see right here with the cancer, that's sort of the, where the rust has eaten through the tray entirely, I hit it with the sandblaster. And that's just this cheapy little handheld sandblaster. And I'm using beach sand. This is stuff that I picked up, I just have it in a bucket. I picked it up off the beach down in California. So it's pretty fine, and that's how I got it down here to bare metal around the hole there, but it's uh, it's pretty thin. And of course, this this side would be where the battery was sitting, and that's why all the, the acid is eaten away at the rust so bad. So even, even with that hole, this tray is still in better condition than the current tray that's in the motorhome. And here's the thing about the underside of this tray, is it has this air tank, and this makes filling up the airbags much quicker. As it currently stands, if those airbags are deflated, it takes like five minutes for them to pump up. And that's just because of this cute little air compressor in here that's dedicated to that singular job. And it, it works, but it takes a little time to, to fill up the volume of those bags. Well, I got the battery tray disassembled here and it is viable. I can make this work. I'm gonna weld that to fix that once I get the rust off it. But how, how am I gonna get the rust off this? That's the question. You guys remember the battery acid from when I was dissolving the steel pin from the aluminum step? The plan is to put the tray into this Tupperware bin here, put some water in there, and add the battery acid to the water. Always, always add acid to water, never water to acid, because the exothermic heat reaction gets ridiculously hot. God, that stuff stinks. 
After like a day and a half in the acid bath, this is what I'm left with, and it's incredible because this was gray metal, uh, nice and gray, just like 10 minutes ago. It's gonna get a thin coat of surface rust here like that quickly. You can see the surface patina is just the quick oxide layer that forms after you pull it out of the acid bath. It's very shallow and it's nothing to worry about. However, there were still some deep pockets of rust and I've mostly gotten rid of those using a um, wire brush there, like you see there. But here on the tray, you can see the rust hole. Nice hole there. But all of the rotting rust has been removed. Well, here's the aqueous sulfuric acid that I've been using. You can see all the rust and paint chips down inside of there. Hopefully you guys can see that on camera. Time to neutralize it here with this baking soda. Let's make it happen. Oh, this is gonna be intense. <laughs> Look at that. Well, this nasty liquid is now to the point where the uh, baking soda no longer causes it to bubble or react in any way. And that means that disgusting as this looks, it's just salty, rusty water. <laughs> the salt would be sodium sulfate, which is a salt that's used in laundry detergents. So this is safe to dispose of now. All right, this is the battery tray that's coming out. It's in pretty bad shape. And this is what's going back in. You can see there's a patch right there for the rust hole, although uh, maybe you guys can still see those pinholes. There's still quite a few holes in there where the rust ate through this tray as well. But this has all been, you know, stripped of rust and painted with three different coats. The top layer here is actually Plasti Dip. So there's a nice rubbery coating to the, uh, the top side of the tray here. I think this will last another 40 years. My friend suggested that I line the whole thing with fiberglass and epoxy, and that's certainly an option down the line. But as you guys know, I went with this old tray design here because all of the bracketry, all the hard work is already done for me. It's ready to receive the air tank. Speaking of which, let's talk about that. Before I clean this tank off and give it a coat of paint, uh, I'm gonna take a look inside there just to make sure it's not too rusty because we all know that when air tanks rust from the inside out, they can explosively decompress and it has killed people in the past, which is not something I wanna have happen to my motorhome. So yeah, look at the rust, not good. There's a lot of moisture in there, big old chunk of rusty metal that fell off from somewhere. And even though the tank can withstand these blows from the hammer, I don't trust it. I don't trust it. So I'm gonna get a new tank. Okay, now you can push it this way. Push it as hard as you can. Wait, push, 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 ready? Two hands. Well, one hand on, push, push. There we go, now it'll come off. Can you get it off now? There we go, thanks for helping me. Check it out guys, my kid learned how to ride a bike. Hey dad. Yes dad. I'm going to film you while you clean your office. Okay, it's not my office though, this is the garage, right? Yeah. Okay, so it's a hundred messy. It's a hundred messy, my garage? I know, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's ten mess. Ten mess, okay, ten mess. But it's more messy than that. The battery tray is installed. I painted the frame underneath the battery tray. It seemed like some of the rust had kind of, you know, dripped down and maybe started to surface rust the frame under there as well, so. Just thought I'd nip that issue in the bud. Firestone Industries, made in the USA. Pretty cool. I've reused the old hose fitting here and it seems to be working just fine and that saves me a bit of money. Now, it's not as convenient as the modern, popular, quick disconnect or quick connect fittings, but I kind of trust it a little bit more. That being said, it's kind of a pain to reuse these, so let me show you how I did that. When you take this apart, what you're gonna find is a barrel like that and it has been swaged down so it has been pinched uh, in there and there's a corresponding sort of conical profile in the cap here and so both of those conical profiles pinch this until it literally bends the metal uh, so that it presses into the plastic. So you have to cut the hose flush with the barrel in order to get it off and then I'm just using my Tecton needle nose pliers here and just working it onto the, the pliers and you can see they're just uh, constantly smooth increasing uh, cone I guess you'd call it. So now I can just slide the cap nut over it and then get that fitting to slide over it. 
put that on there and that should work just fine. So this is a centrifugal water separator. The air comes through here and it just gets spun around the outside of this and it causes the water to sort of, um, you know, separate out from the air in the middle. There's also kind of a little micron uh, filter there in the center. So it does help keep the moisture out of the tank. It doesn't completely remove the moisture, but it makes a big difference. But I don't trust this old one, so I've got a new one on order. Well, that looks really good, and it's gonna be really nice to just be able to press a button and whoosh, whoosh, the motorhome will go up and down very quickly. This is the torsion bar spring, which is held in tension, and it's actually a, an adjustable tension at the back there using a bolt just like this one. So you can see it's a very specialized bolt. It has a domed tip because it kind of rides in a little cup, and it's a an hardened grade eight bolt, and it's fully threaded. Unfortunately, this one here, is quite bent. I think they must have hit some sort of debris in the road or something. I don't know how that got bent. I was able to pick up this fully threaded bolt at the hardware store. Um, it is also grade eight, but you can see it's uh, too short. Now it is fully threaded and they had the same length as this one, the, but it was not fully threaded. You know, the bottom inch or so um, was just a smooth shaft. All right, I've ground this nice dome profile into the bolt and I think that's gonna work, but I'd still like to get a suitable replacement that's the full length, fully threaded. So maybe I can find this exact component from the dealership, or barring that, I'll, I'll try McMaster car and see if they have a fully threaded version. By the way, this thing being bent means it's just a good idea to replace it. But beyond that, I can't actually use this to adjust the suspension height because the, the bent threads here no longer thread into the collar. And there it is installed with red Loctite, ready to adjust the height on the motorhome. Here's the box I've been waiting for from Manny. Let's see what's in here. There we go, new ball joints at the tip and new bushings here at the back, which means you can see he had to cut this part out here. Not on this one, just on this side. This should be everything I need for reassembly. You can see the lower A-arms, the upper A-arms still need to be cleaned entirely. I haven't even started to clean those. The wheel spacers are, you know, brand new. These are the new, um, axles, so the new, you know, robust four-wheel drive truck axles. And then I've just got the brake caliper, brake pads, some new brake lines, and these are all the new parts for the sway bar. So uh, these are the new bushings to hold the sway bar to the frame, and these are the new sway bar rod ends. New strut, side-by-side -side comparison, what's coming off, what's going back on. This brake rotor here is 12 and a half inches. The one that's coming off is only 11 inches. And just the whole knuckle in general is a lot more robust. Look right there. There's a tiny bit of play in these bearings. Maybe it's not that tiny. <laughs> yeah, those wheel bearings definitely need to be replaced at the very least. So there's a couple of reasons for the upgrade. Better braking, bearing replacement, and I now have more modern CV joints that I can actually buy replacements for. This box of hardware comes in the kit included from Manny, and it comes with this second set of lug nuts that you'll need for the wheel spacers. And it's also got these fancy bolts with the 12 point head that are the replacement for the ones that I pulled out. You can see same deal, 12 point head, but there are some differences. The head on this one is quite a bit larger, so it's the next size up, and they are longer as well. Now, the ones that I pulled off, this is the worst of them, and you can see it looks, I don't know, can you guys see that? It looks like it's pitted but there's no rust, so I don't know where that pitting would come from, except that most of them look like this, which is perfectly fine. So I believe that I could reuse these and have no issue. But a helpful commenter pointed out that at least in some of the manuals for the, the automobiles that came with these really burly Oldsmobile front wheel drivetrains, it tells you that if you remove the drive axles, you are supposed to replace these bolts. And you can see the length of the bolts that I pulled out is just enough to go through the flange here and still have some good threads for bearing. On the upgraded drive shaft, the flange is not as thick, so that's where the uh, shortened bolt comes in. Still gonna have plenty of threads for a nice bearing into the you know corresponding threaded holes on the differential. A Little bit of red thread lock, and these are ready to be installed. So I've attacked the A-arms here with the wire wheel on the angle grinder, and then in the hard to reach nooks and crannies, I got at it with the little mini sandblaster gun. You can see that it's not perfect, but the rust is thin enough now. It's just some surface rust where I can spray it with this um, rust encapsulating or 
rust converting paint. And hey, these things lasted 40 years in this condition. And with a little bit of paint here, I'm sure they'll last another 40 years. Brake cleaner spray and wipe and ready for paint. And the A-arms have been painted. Just need to make sure these bearing surfaces here are completely clean of any of the sandblasting debris or paint and it's ready for installation. Okay, now that I've completed the installation on the other side, I think I understand the best sequence of events to get this installed. First thing to do is to detach this cross member from the frame right here. And this allows me to sort of swing it out of the way because it's bent, I need to straighten it, but because it's bent, it's going to um, sort of hit this portion of the A-arm. And so we need to get it out of the way. The second thing I need to do is take this um, little, I don't know what to call this, carrier piece for the bolt that I made earlier, and it needs to be removed completely from the place back there where the uh, torsion bar, eh, yeah, you can see it, where the torsion bar attaches. So you can see if I rotate, see how that pops out? So we need to get that lined up to just the right spot, and then I can uh, try to index the A-arm here to this end of the torsion bar in just the right way. Can't forget the grease. Through a combination of hitting it with the hammer and lifting it up and down, I should be able to get this aligned. Now that those are installed, have your wife step on this part right here in order to unwind the spring so that you can get the bolt reinstalled back there. And that's the hardest part of the whole install. So the rust over here was a bit deeper than surface rust. It was getting a texture to it, you know, it was kind of eating into the metal. Like this, you don't worry about that. But when it starts to get textured, that's uh, problematic. And the reason is because the texture allows the rust to sort of hold moisture. And the more the water doesn't just run off of it. And so it sits there and soaks in and that, you know, rust begets more rust. Also, it's even worse when the paint is sort of bubbling up and underneath the bubbled up paint, you have water being held against the metal. So in the interest of a little bit of remediation, I just sort of attack the worst of it with the wire wheel and a wire brush. And man, oh man, do I need new drills. These ones are from like 2002, I think, when I used to work construction down in San Diego. <laughs> they are antiquated, let me tell you. That's a brushed motor in there. Everybody's gone to brushless now. All right, a light coat of this rust converting paint and the knuckle has been installed. The drive axle has been installed at this end only. This end here is still floppy. Yeah, I hit the bolts with a wire brush as well, and now they install from the inside to the outside. And now that the torsion spring and lower A-arm are fully installed, in order to get the upper A-arm ball joint into the knuckle, it's gonna require jacking up the lower A-arm. Just like that. And while it's jacked up, you can see I used the opportunity to also get that shock absorber installed. To get this steering arm installed, we rotate it 180 degrees so that it can come up from underneath. That means we need to loosen uh, these nuts, but those are gonna need quite a bit of adjusting anyway for the towing and tow in, tow out uh, adjustment when we do the alignment. Time to install the brake caliper using this quarter inch drive hex key. Brake line, hub spacer. Well, time to crawl up under there and attach the drive axle to the differential using the fancy bolts. And the final thing to install is the sway bar here, but there's a problem. This is the bushing that holds the sway bar to the frame. It's not like dry rotted really. There's a couple of little cracks, but it's not doing too, too bad. It's just kind of misshapen. And this is the bushing that I got to replace it, Moog K5253. And you can see that's quite a different shape, even compensating for this thing being all squished. So there might be different bushings from the early years to the later years. Remember, this is a 1978 model. So I think I'm gonna hold off installing that until I can get the correct bushings. So with the order of operations that I followed to get the whole front end installed, I did not need to purchase this tool. This is for loading and unloading the torsion bar spring while you work on things, but yeah, not necessary. What is necessary is a socket for the axle nut. The one that came off of it was an inch and a half, if you'll recall. I had to spend $20 on a single socket and it's too big for the axle nut that's going back on. Now I think I'm going to make it work, but it looks like I need inch and three eighths. 
So, the new front end is fully assembled. And now the hard part, or maybe the fun part, begins. I actually am really looking forward to this. I get to bleed the, bleed the brake lines, which can be kind of messy, but also kind of fun because it's kind of technical. And then I'm going to try to do the, uh, the alignment myself and see how good I can get it. Now, I know they've got like lasers and all kinds of fancy machines down there at the auto, you know, the alignment shop. But uh, apparently a lot of... Uh, DIYers align these motorhomes. Something about the length of the motorhome makes it easier to, to align, maybe? I don't know. So I'm going to give it a go, see what I can figure out next time. And I also need to torque down every bolt that I touched to specification. Now I need to look up the specifications. I don't know all of the, the bolt specs. Um, and I guess I could just wing it. <laughs> I remember how much force it took to get a lot of those things off, so I can just try to put that much muscle into it on this end. But... Uh, yeah, rusty old bolts take a lot more force to take off than uh, putting it on there, so that would be over torquing. And so it'd be best to I should I should look it up in the manual to see what I'm supposed to torque all those down to. If you know, goodness, please save me some time. Give me some torque specs, you guys. Now I want to talk about the pros and the cons of this front end. The pros obviously outweigh the cons, otherwise I would not have have done the job. So okay, first of all, I love the increased brake diameter. It's going to stop even better. And it didn't really have a problem stopping before, but it's going to stop really well now. Um, I do also love that overbuilt front knuckle. That's going to be way stronger. The fact that I can get CV joints or just entire new uh, half shafts, the drive axles. So the old ones, I can't get new ones. The best I could do is like the used ones that I've got out there. I might be able to find some version of that that somebody else pulled off of one of these. Uh, but I can get new, brand new in the box. Uh, replacements for the CV joints if they go out. I've actually had CV joints go out on two different automobiles that I owned so CV joints are a weak point and uh, I don't actually hear of a lot of people blowing out their CV joints on these motorhomes but it, it's got to happen. CV joints have a certain lifespan so uh, that's the major major reason to do this upgrade just to, to give you the ability to replace that part when needed. Doing this job also meant replacing all of the bushings which you saw the old dry rotted bushings that I used to have there so that's a nice peace of mind although uh, nasty as that looked I don't think that mechanically it was affecting anything yet I mean it, given 10 or 15 more years that could have been catastrophic so it was a job that needed doing okay so those are all the pluses and there's a lot of them but to me there's one major negative and that is the fact that there's that wheel spacer and it, I think it's required for the stock wheel uh, it's what I hear that the, the stock wheel spacing just the shape of that rim needs that uh, that hub You know adapter to space it out farther out so that we can clear the larger brake rotor Which I already covered is something that I'm really happy about but that adapter is problematic for two reasons first of all it doubles the complexity instead of eight lug nuts you now have 16 lug nuts and eight of those lug nuts are um, hub centric they've got the the conical shape to them so the i'm sorry they're lug centric so that so the conical shape on the lug is what's holding the spacer to the new hubs to the the brake rotor hub assembly and so okay that's fine but then you have another whole set of you know studs lug studs for the wheel and my rims are hub centric so the hub centric reels which are steel are now going to be riding on a an aluminum uh you know flange so that's what all the weight's going to be borne by an aluminum flange from my steel rims and it's it's you know, like i said it's it's hub centric so i have both lug centric and hub centric so i get the worst of both of them and the best of them but the complexity is doubled and everybody knows the kiss principle right keep it simple stupid another way of saying this is less is more that's Mies van der that's from the design world elon musk talks about this he says the best part is no part it can't break it never goes wrong you don't need to replace it yeah so the the simpler design is always the better design and that hub increases complexity so or that, that i should say that hub you know spacer increases complexity so that's no good and the other reason that i don't like it is it cantilevers off so in effect it's like if you're trying to hold a heavy weight you hold it close to your body you try to hold that heavy weight farther out and your muscles are really straining it takes a lot more strength uh to just hold that out there so by pushing the wheels farther out uh the bearings in the hub are going to be under a lot more stress now those are way more uh substantial those bearings compared to the ones that i removed but still, that's uh, unneeded, unnecessary stress to put on those. 
But the other thing that I, I forgot to mention as a plus is the fact that the, the hubs space the wheels out to where uh, you're like down railroad tracks. So the front and rear wheels now track in the exact same path. So, you know, the rear wheels are going to drive in the groove left by the front wheels. And this is different from the stock setup where the wheels are actually inboard at the front compared to the uh, wheels at the back. And some people complain that when you're driving down the freeway and you get into like a road that the, the, the big, you know, tractor trailers are constantly driving down in the heat or whatever, and you get those ruts or, you know, the, the, the tractor trailer wheels, you know, make the, give the road sort of depressions in the wheel tracks. And um, with these offset wheels like that, Apparently the motorhome gets squirrely as it's trying to kind of fight that wheel track. It doesn't it doesn't track quite right. So you have to get in the fast lane, uh, and then if you wanted to just be cruising at 65 or 60 or 55 even, because you got nowhere to be in a hurry and you're trying to save gas, well, then everybody who wants to be in the fast lane is mad at you. So you're either stuck in the slow lane going whoop, 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 or you're pissing people off because you're taking up the fast lane. So this will solve that problem when all four or all six wheels are tracking down the same, you know, exact tracks. Uh, it will fix that. So, uh, yeah, I think there's more pluses than minuses. I think the fact that that knuckle is just so incredibly burly that the uh, that the the bearings are more substantial. I think it's all going to be a okay, and I'm going to be really happy with this upgrade. These are the guys who are supporting this channel on Patreon, and I can't thank them enough. It's a small list, but you guys mean the world to me. <laughs> there's a uh, there's not a lot of money in rebuilding GMC motorhomes, so uh, but beyond the money, you know, it's like a vote of confidence, and I really appreciate that. So yeah, all right. Well, tune into the next video. I don't know what that'll be. Hopefully next week, maybe maybe next month. I don't know. Uh, as soon as I can get the work done, I'll show you guys how I do the alignment job. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.